Jesus before his public ministry began, and so we'll be continuing that uh, this morning. The title of the message is Living and Learning. We'll go ahead and start right out with our passage, and uh, then we'll unpack it. The setting is uh, Joseph and Mary are living in Nazareth, and they're getting ready to take a pilgrimage, a yearly annual pilgrimage, to Jerusalem for one of the major festivals. It says, Every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast, according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. The word of the Lord. So this is really the only story that we have of Jesus as he's growing up. I mean, we've got his birth narrative, but he's about 12 years old here, and we don't really see much of his early life. He's taking a family pilgrimage uh, for a major Passover festival in Jerusalem, and then he's returning home to Nazareth, where he spends the vast majority of his life. And it just simply says, and he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor of with God and men. So Jesus lived in this small town in northern Israel in a region called Galilee in a village called Nazareth. And it's just a little bit uh, west of the Sea of Galilee over here on this mountain range. This is the Val Jezreel Valley. And here's some cliffs that we're going to see in a moment. The town was likely founded by Jews after they returned from the Babylonian exile. So there's a picture of Nazareth village, and you can visit this today, and what it is is a place where they reenact what life would have been like in the first century in Nazareth. And so it's quite an eye-opening experience. Those that had actually established this village shortly before the time of Jesus living there likely uh, had a very strong focus on the Mishiach, or the Messiah, who was proclaimed to come, the righteous branch of David as the Old Testament calls him. Nazareth, the word, probably comes from the Hebrew word netzer, which means branch or shoot. And it was prophesied in the Old Testament that a branch or a shoot would rise out of the stump of Jesse. What does that mean, the stump of Jesse? Uh, the stump is like this tree, the family tree, but it's been cut off. Remember, Jesse's son is David, and a line from David of great kings came. But that kingship ultimately came to an end, and so it was cut off, and so you have this picture of a stump, but now there's a shoot that is coming out of it. A new king that will arise out of this line that had been cut off at one point. The townspeople, when the Messiah finally come, actually try to throw the Messiah off a nearby precipice. So here's a picture that I had the opportunity to take. I, I actually only thought to take it as we were driving past the actual face of the precipice. So this is coming around the side because there's no way to go straight up into Nazareth. You have to take the long way around because there's a cliff face. And so this is part of the cliff face in front of uh, the village of Nazareth. So Nazareth is actually just a, a little bit over that hill in a basin just to the north of that hill. Go ahead to the next slide. Here is an elevation chart, just so you can get an idea. So this is different elevations from north to south in Israel. This is the Jezreel Valley that we'll be looking at in a moment. Here's that cliff face that you see. 
And Nazareth is just on this other side of that cliff face. So a major rise. When they talk about when Jesus comes to visit, taking him and throwing him off the cliff, that is where it would have happened. And he, he actually escaped through their hands, thankfully. If you look to the north from that cliff face, you see the modern day city of Nazareth, which looks a whole lot different than it did 2,000 years ago. It is a city that boasts 77,000 people now. It is the largest Arab city in Israel today. And there is a church of the Annunciation that is hidden in the midst of there uh, that you can visit and also Nazareth Village on the outskirts. They found some archaeological evidence uh, of homes from the first century. Uh, and so you can actually see what a home of Jesus would have looked like, whether it actually was the home of Jesus, I think is highly unlikely. Uh, but, you know, they, they, a lot of people are saying maybe this was. Uh, but there's actually been very little archaeological excavations in Nazareth. And here's the reason why. <laughs> because a great city has been built over it, which limits the ability to start digging into the ground. Now, Jesus would have been very familiar with not this site per se. He would have had this view, but all those buildings wouldn't have been there. It just would have been a small village. But go ahead to the next slide. Looking out from the Nazareth Ridge, what Jesus would have looked upon was the Jezreel Valley a great expansive overlook. And in the Jezreel Valley, though difficult to see here, I'll give you a different map in just a moment, Jesus would have had a great view of places that are very familiar in the Old Testament, places where incredible things have happened. This is Mount Tabor. Many call this the Mount of Transfiguration or believe that it's where Jesus' transfiguration would have happened. Uh, here's a place called Endor that we'll get to in a little bit. Uh, Mount Mora, just on the other side of Mount Mora is Mount Gilboa. Here is Nain, uh, which is the New Testament name for it, but has a different Old Testament name that we'll get into and major significant events happen here. Mount Carmel is further over here to the west, but is visible if it's a clear day. That's where Elijah fought the uh, prophets of Baal on that mountain. And then in the distance on a clear day, you can see Megiddo. Megiddo is very famous, site of many battles that occurred, and is in the book of Revelation as the place where the end times battle will occur. This is Jesus' view from the Nazareth Ridge, which being having been a boy, I know Jesus would have spent plenty of time on this ridge looking out over that. What he would have seen uh, here is major caravans that are going through. There was a major road that stretched from north to south as south as far as Egypt and as far northeast as Damascus, a city in Syria, a major city of the day. And he would have seen major caravans of merchants going through. He would have seen Roman armies passing through. In fact, that's why the Roman roads were actually made. Uh, they were made for the Roman armies so that the armies could get to where they needed to go over their vast empire as quickly as possible so that they could defend their empire whenever was necessary. Go ahead to the next slide. Many biblical events took place in this region. So here we have Nazareth Ridge is right here. Here's the Jezreel Valley. Jesus would have looked out and looked south among this valley. And here are some things that would have, he would have looked at that would have happened. He would have looked at the plain of Tabor, which is where, remember Deborah, the Old Testament judge? She was approached by a commander, Barak, a commander of the Israelite army. And he was asking what they should do as there was a threat coming to Israel. And she said, you need to go out and you can fight and take on and God will overcome. He was too afraid to go alone and he wouldn't go alone without her going with them as a representative of God. She says, I will go with you, but know that the glory of this battle will go to women. So she gets the glory. And then you remember the story from a man named Sisera, who they were hunting, a captain in the other army, the opposing army, who hides in a tent. And do you remember the story of a woman who covers him? And then she takes a tent peg and a mallet and she drives it through his head. So she was the one who received the glory for killing the commander of the opposing army that day. That happens right here and this is a place that Jesus would have had full view and looked on as he was recounting the story. He said, this is where that took place. And then there was, of course, Mount Mora and Gilboa, where Gideon and his army faced the Midianites. You remember the story of he had this big army and God said, okay, I want you to take all your men and have them drink water from this, from this lake in the spring. And the ones who lapped the water, well, some of them 
went home. And in the end, only 300 were left. He says, now I want you to take these 300 and you're going to take those 300 and go out and fight that army of the Midianites. And of course, you know, he, like you and I, would have been like, wait a second, you just depleted our army and now we're going to go? We already weren't sure if we stood a chance. And God said, it's because I want you to know and I want the Israelites to know it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit that we go forward that I did this for you. Jesus would have looked out from that valley and saw where that battle took place. And then there's the village of Endor, which you might remember when King Saul went to consult a medium, a witch, about another battle. And she said, how do I know you're not tricking me? You know the king has annihilated all the witches. And he says, No, no, this isn't a trick. And so she conjures up the spirit of the prophet of the dead prophet, Samuel, who then Saul begins to consult with and didn't receive any good news from Samuel, who says, tomorrow you shall die in battle. And the next day, indeed, Saul did die in battle. And right over here at the foot of Mount Gilboa, also visible, Jesus is looking, watching, contemplating these stories. And then there is Old Testament Shunem, which is New Testament Nain. You'll remember Old Testament Shunem as the place where the prophet Elisha raised a dead boy back to life. This will be the same place that Jesus does an incredible miracle of raising a dead boy back to life. And he chooses this place to do it for a reason, to make the connection between his ministry, because everyone remembered what the prophet Elisha did here. And so when Jesus does the same thing, it sends one message. In fact, Luke sums up that message in Luke 7, 16, when he recounts the story saying, a great prophet has risen among us. And you almost get the undertone again. He remembers what happened here. Jesus is one called by God, just like Elisha was. This is a man come from God. And then in the far distance is Megiddo. And Megiddo is a place where many battles took place. It is a fought over place. And the reason why is because this is a major international highway that passes through here. And if you control this, one king said, if you control Megiddo, you control a thousand cities. And Megiddo, of course, will be the place where Revelation says the old end time battle will take place, Armageddon. Jesus has this view of all these things, including Mount Carmel over here, where the prophet Elijah had a great battle with the Baal prophets. As a boy, Jesus probably loved standing atop this ridge, looking out over the valley, watching the merchant caravans and the military legions traveling back and forth, remembering the biblical stories of old and what was yet before him. Because we saw in this, as a boy at 12 years old, he already knew he was being called by the Father. He knew that he had a special purpose. So when Jesus is thinking about these stories of old, he's thinking about his own story and how these stories overlap with him and what he's going to do. And he's learning lessons from those stories and from what's going on today. Uh, This is Chandler uh, Collins, who is was the dean of Jerusalem University College. So this is a picture uh, that I snapped as Chandler was talking about the same story and going over these same things with us and looking out over the Jezreel Valley. Uh, Chandler just moved back to the States two months ago, uh, had a little girl, and he now resides, guess where? In Grand Rapids, Michigan. So if you ever want to look him up and take him out for dinner, you can pick his brain on uh, the land of Israel and all that took place there. Jesus' ministry only lasted about three years, from the time maybe about 30 years of age to about 33 years of age. And the vast majority of his life, his time on earth, is unknown to us. We don't know what the details are. Now, there is an ancient manuscript that tries to fill in some of the blanks for us. It's called the Infancy Gospel of Thomas. And not knowing All that took place as Jesus was being raised and worked in Nazareth and nearby. This gospel tries to say, this is what I think took took place. And it doesn't depict Jesus as the nice boy that we might imagine him to be. In fact, it was known as part of the Gnostic teachings. 
And the Gnostics believed in very much that you had to learn and grow, which I believe as well, but they believed that Jesus himself had to differentiate and learn to differentiate between good and evil, which we don't believe. We believe that Jesus was without sin, and he certainly had to learn and grow, but we don't believe that he had to partake in evil to understand it. So here's some examples of some of the things that this gospel uh, talks about. It tells, tells a story of Jesus at five years old where he was playing in the waters of a brook and he stops up the waters, kind of like Moses did at the Red Sea and like Joshua did at the crossing of the Jordan. And so he gathers all the waters into one place, amusing the kids around him. And then he makes these, um, these pigeons out of clay. And one of the boys, being a good Jewish boy in the town of Nazareth, runs and tells his family that Jesus has done work on the Sabbath. He made something. And so the elders come and they see that Jesus indeed had made this pigeons out of clay. And they rebuke him for it. And he responds by turning the pigeons into real pigeons and they fly away and they're amazed. And wonder, what kind of boy is this? And then another boy takes a stick during the same occurrence and he splashes in the water of the brook, dispersing the waters. And Jesus becomes upset and he says, and, and I quote, and, straight, and, and he curses the boy and tells him that he's going to wither like a dead tree. And I quote from the text, and straightway the lad withered up wholly. So the boy died. Another time, it says, a boy bumped into Jesus as he was running by him, and Jesus said, and I quote, thou shalt not finish thy course. I don't know why he spoke in King James Version, but. <laughs> and immediately he fell down and died. Now, the townspeople were obviously very upset about this, especially the boy's parents. And so they came and complained to Joseph about his son. And, you know, now two boys have, been, have died because of their son. And so Jesus smote the complainers with blindness. <laughs> Jesus did some good things too as he learns to differentiate between what is right and what is wrong and what, what he should do and what he shouldn't do. One day, uh, Joseph, being a carpenter, had made some oxen yokes. But when he stood the yokes on end, he realized that one was shorter than the other. And as John DeCline has actually told me, it's easy to cut a piece of wood to size, but it's really difficult to make it grow and lengthen. Well, unless, of course, your apprentice is the young Jesus. When he saw this problem, Jesus simply spoke the word and the wood stretched and the problem was solved. And then at another time, Jesus uh, healed different people and he even raised a dead boy who he was accused of killing, but Jesus said, not this time, it wasn't my fault. And he raised the boy back to life. Now, the infancy gospels of Thomas were written a hundred possibly 200 years after the life of Jesus. While they're very entertaining, they were never thought to be true or accurate. They were just someone having some fun filling in the blanks and being imaginative. And so we might ask ourselves, so what then did Jesus do with the majority of his time on earth? And what we get is verse 52. Well, he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Jesus grew up in the village of Nazareth. And while Nazareth, Nazareth is now a bustling village or city of 77,000 people, in Jesus' day, it was just an out-of-the-way village of 100 to 300 people in a little, what they call kind of a, a basin or a bowl on the other side of that Nazareth ridge. It was a place where everyone knew each other. In fact, when Jesus returns as a visiting rabbi some years later, they say, isn't this the carpenter's son? And they know his mother and his brothers by name. What we do know about Jesus' life, that it was in Jesus that God became human and did what humans do. He grew both outwardly and inwardly. He saw, observed, listened, wondered, learned. This is what he did for the vast majority of his time on earth as a human being. Life had something to teach him because life is learning. Jesus lived and learned Jesus learned his father's trade. 
His father in the Greek is what they would call a tecton, a builder or a craftsman. While we popularly characterize him as a carpenter, one who works with wood, while that is possible, it's highly unlikely. And the reason why is that most tecton or most tectoi, the plural in the Greek, in Israel were stone workers. We've talked about this before, but why might they be stone workers and not carpenters? Right, there's not much wood, and there's a whole lot of limestone. Almost everything then and now in Israel was built out of limestone. And so that's most likely what Jesus found himself doing. Now, there's a place called Sepphoris, which is a town or a city, which is just about an hour's walk north, about four or five miles north from the city of Nazareth. Go ahead to the next slide. So Jesus lives in this little town where there's probably not a whole lot of work for a technon. And it is very likely that Jesus and his father Joseph would have traveled to Sepphoris. And Sepphoris was a big city and it was a growing city during Jesus' time. In fact, Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great, was now the leader in this region. And he renovated this city and fortified it. And it becomes the capital of all the region of Galilee. And all of this is going on while Jesus is living in a nearby town called Nazareth. This major renovation uh, project and fortification would have called for many technons to come. They would have needed a lot of craftsmen and builders for this project. And it may have been the reason why Joseph moves his family to Nazareth in the first place. Now, Nazareth is a small Jewish village. And it is very conservative Jewish folks who are looking forward to and anticipating the Messiah coming. Later becomes a very priestly village with lots of uh, New Testament but Jewish priests living in that area. So it's very possible that Jesus made a regular trek to Sepphoris to work on projects that are going on there that need technons in the vicinity. In Nazareth, Jesus learns how to live out his Jewish faith among his Jewish faithful people. But in Sepphoris, Jesus sees how the rest of the world lives. And this is the world that he's going to need to bring the message of the gospel and the kingdom of God to. The next slide right here is Sepphoris from above. This is the archaeological remains of the city today. Here's an old Greek theater, Roman theater, uh, where maybe Jesus, where he talks about hypocrites. That was one of the words used in the theater for someone who wears a mask. And there is a Jewish synagogue in the area, so we know that there were Jewish people living in that area. Uh, This is a crusader fort, so from much later than the time of Jesus, way after. And you can walk this today. Go ahead to the next slide. Uh, These are some pictures that I had the opportunity and privilege to take when I got to visit. This is the main cardo, the main road that ran through the center of the city. If Jesus worked here as a technon, he certainly would have walked on this road. And this is a fun place to visit. Uh, They would have needed many tectons to be able to build this, to dig out. It's an old Roman reservoir. So this is a water channel. And today it is devoid of water, so you can actually walk through it and see how they would have stored and kept their water. And the tecton would have been chiseling this out. It was an incredible, vast project that was going on during the time of Jesus. So it's very possible that Jesus might have spent a lot of time working in this city and learning about what the world is like and thinking about how do I enter into this world with the call that I have. From Jesus' view upon the Nazareth Ridge overlooking the Jezreel Valley, we can imagine him carefully considering the lives of the Old Testament saints. He contemplates Gideon's trust in the face of overwhelming odds. And as he thinks about the world that he's going to enter with the message of the kingdom that he's been entrusted with, he's going to face overwhelming odds and will have to trust the Father to bring about the fruit of this mission. He thinks about Deborah's courageous leadership where many men had failed before. And I wonder if this isn't what he was thinking about in the Garden of Gethsemane when he's praying, Lord, let this be taken from me. Nevertheless, Not my will, but your will be done. And he moves forward with what God has called him toward. He's probably thinking about King Saul, who was, of course, the first king of Israel. And Jesus is the ultimate king of Israel. 
But Saul had sold out to the world. And I got to wonder, when Satan was tempting Jesus and showing him all the cities of the world and saying, this could all be yours easily if you just bow down and worship me. That's all you have to do. You don't have to do the hard way. You don't have to take the Father's path. I'll tell you, I'll give it to you. It belongs to me. I won it in a bet. And I wonder if Jesus was thinking about how Saul had sold out to the world and what that ultimately led to. And then Elisha, who had followed Elijah. And Elisha, in that town of Nain, used to, how he raised that child to life. But I think it's interesting that Elisha follows Elijah because do you remember who Elijah is in the New Testament? John. Remember they said, but wait, if you're the Messiah, I thought Elijah was supposed to come. But they were taking everything too literally, as we often do. And Jesus said to him, Elijah has come. And if you'll accept it, it's John. Do you remember what John was wearing and eating? He was wearing a belt of camel leather and camel hair, and he was eating locusts. And if you go back to the Old Testament, do you know what Elijah was wearing? Same thing. Do you know what he was eating? Same thing. Jesus said, John is the Elijah, not not the literal Elijah, but the spirit of Elijah, one who comes in the likeness of Elijah. You missed it. You didn't connect the dots. And that means that Jesus is like Elisha, the one who follows John, who is actually the greater prophet. Elisha had more power than Elijah. And he raises a boy where? In Nain, the same place that Elisha raised a dead boy to life, so that we didn't miss the point. And no doubt, as he looked out upon Megiddo, he thought about his own end time battle that was to come. But he would discover that in surrender to God would come the greatest victory of all through resurrection. Jesus will take what he learns in the world where he lives, what he sees, and he'll use it as he seeks to save the lost world. This life is about learning. I'm reminded of a song that maybe you're familiar with. It was from the 90s by a a woman, an artist named Alanis Morissette, and it was called You Learn. And I'll read you some of the verses. She says, you live, you learn. You love, you learn. You grieve, you learn. You lose, you learn. She goes on to say, I recommend getting your heart trampled on to anyone. Why? Because you bleed, you learn. You scream, you learn. I recommend biting off more than you can chew to anyone. Why? Because you choose, you learn, you pray, you learn, you laugh, you learn, you live, you learn. Life has something to teach us. For 30 years, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. And if it took that long for a sinless man to be ready for what God had for him, we can be thankful that God takes more time with us and is more patient with us. 1 Corinthians 3, 9, it says, For we are co-laborers with God. You are God's field, God's building. I love this idea of being co-laborers with God. But what are we working on with God? Well, It's so easy to look outwardly at everything and everyone else in the world that needs to change. But the work that God is doing is in your own life. That's why the second part of that verse says, you are God's field, God's building. You're the field that God is tending to in order to grow his crop, his produce. And you are the building project that God is working on. And you are working with God in this tending and in this building. And the context is your own life. That's the place where God is at work. And so this life is about living and learning. And it's a long, slow process. You might call it a labor of love. And we get to take part in deciding how the experiences, how the lessons will shape us. We can become bitter or we can become better. We can live and lament, or we can live and learn. Andrea Dykstra writes, 
In order to love who you are, you cannot hate the experiences that shaped you. I remember a specific point in my life where I was lamenting some of my past. And I heard a word from God. When I hear a word from God, it's few and far between, and it's usually very short and concise. And this is what I heard. Don't despise your journey. Don't despise your journey. There were things that I had wished could have been different, that I could have done differently. I could have learned differently. And I realized that all of that was part of what made me who I am today. It was part of the learning process. We get to choose how we will respond to our experiences. And of course, some will become more fearful and bitter, suspicious, protective, negative, rigid. You've run into people like this, and you're like, what happened? And then you're like, I don't care about what happened. I'm going to avoid this person like the plague, right? They're not enjoyable to be around. Others become more optimistic, compassionate, hopeful, accepting, generous, adaptable. I think about Jim Inman, who I like to use our patron saint here at Evergreen Covenant Church. And Jim was one of the nicest guys you could ever meet, one of the sweetest, most helpful, caring, loving, tender hearted men. You ever sit with him and listen to some of his story? He'd been through some really difficult things some incredible losses. And you wonder, how, Jim, did you go through that and become the person you are today? It's how he chose to interpret those experiences, what they showed him, what he learned. He talked to me about when he wasn't such a nice guy, a divorce that he went through, but how he learned from it, how he grew. And I couldn't imagine Jim ever being different than the person I knew him to be but he told me that it's because of what he went through that he became the person who he was. And not everything we've experienced was good or right. And I would say it's not even necessarily what God wanted for us. But because there is a God, we are invited to believe what is written in Romans 8, 28 and 29, where it says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. Think about all that Jesus went through and how he turned out. It's amazing. The main goal of life isn't to get to a place of leisure. I enjoy those times, but life is for learning. God is using everything. We get to take part in deciding how we will let our life experiences shape us. And we need not fear whatever we face. Verse 31 of that same chapter goes on to say, What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? In other words, God is redeeming everything. He's using everything. Even what someone might have meant for evil, God is turning toward the good in your life if you'll let him as you work with him. So learn everything that you can learn and let your learning lead to, lean toward love as it did for Jesus. For this is the true measure of our learning that we might love as he loves. John thirteen thirty five. Jesus says, for this is how they will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. Our learning is to help us to lean toward love. We work with God, and we get to be determiners in whether that happens. Thankfully, God is for us and not against us, and he can do more than we could ever ask, think, or imagine. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks. Uh, we give you thanks for all the life of Jesus teaches us. And though we don't know all that he went through, uh, we can look back on our own lives and imagine. For we remember that the scripture says that he experienced what we've experienced. We have a high priest that knows what we've experienced. So we thank you for all that you went through in the life of Christ. 
And we thank you for who Christ turned out to be. That he used everything to become more like the person that you know him to be. And that you are using everything in our lives to make us more like Christ, each in our own unique way. So Lord, I pray for redemption, redemption of our life experiences, for the hurts, for the ways that we have suffered, for the places that we found ourselves that were beyond our own control. May you enter into this darkness and may you redeem it, even as you're redeeming the lives of those that we saw, those kids through Destiny Rescue. May you remind us that you are redeeming all things in our life as well. And may you show us how to turn all things toward the good, that we might be the fields that produce an incredible crop a hundredfold, that we might be the buildings that is being built together to become your temple, the place where you reside, and that your life might shine through our lives because of the work that you're doing with us the work that we do with you. Help us to be intentive and intentional. And help us to have the hope that knows that you redeem all things. In Jesus' name we pray.